Procyon Lotor. We all know them better as raccoons, and they are ubiquitous in North America, and now are being seen in Europe and Japan. When most people think of raccoons and infectious disease, they think of rabies. However, there is a relatively rare, albeit very serious infection that people can contract through exposure with raccoon feces and surrounding raccoon latrines. It's a parasitic roundworm, the raccoon roundworm, called Bayless Ascaris procyonis. Joining me on the phone to learn more about Bayless Ascaris, its geographic spread in the U.S. South, and some of the latest research is Michael Yabsley, Ph.D. Dr. Yabsley is an associate professor with the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine. Good afternoon, Dr. Yabsley, and thanks for talking to me about this most fascinating parasite. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Well, I would I would venture to say that the majority of people have no clue what Bayless Ascaris is. So let's start out with the basics. What is Bayless Ascaris? Well, Bayless Ascaris is a large roundworm that lives in the intestines of raccoons. And it's not uncommon for raccoons in certain parts of the country to have hundreds of these parasites in their intestines, and they have no ill consequences associated with those infections. Um, most people would be more familiar with a cousin of the Bayless Ascaris worm, and that would be Toxicara canis, which is a very common roundworm in puppies. And even kittens can have roundworms when they're young. Okay. And so how do people get infected, and is there a certain group of people that are at greatest risk? People become infected with Bayless Ascaris by ingesting eggs that have been passed in the feces of raccoons that have sat in the environment for about two to three weeks uh, to become infectious. So unfortunately, most of the cases of human Bayless Ascaris infection are in young children or individuals who put um, feces or dirt or things into their mouth that they shouldn't put into their mouth. And um, it's, it's generally associated with young children. Sure. And can other animals become infected with this parasite? Yes, there are hundreds of different species of animals that have served as either natural or experimental host for Bayless Ascaris, and they pick it up the same way as people do, by ingesting feces or food or water that's been contaminated with raccoon feces. Okay. And um, the disease um, of Bayless Ascaris infection, what are the signs and the symptoms that we see um, from this very... Uh, severe uh, disease? It varies considerably depending on the species of animal that you're talking about, as well as the number of larvae that they ingest. So if you've got a very small animal, such as a quail or a small rabbit or a rodent, and they ingest you know, a large number of Bayless Ascaris eggs, they're much more likely to have larvae that start migrating through their brain or their eyes, which is going to cause a very severe illness. On the other hand, if you've got a larger animal and they ingest smaller numbers of eggs, the larvae will migrate through their tissues and cause some minimal damage maybe to their lungs or their liver, but won't necessarily make it to their brains, and so those individuals won't get as sick. And it's the same in people. We see the most severe infections in young children because they're smaller and they also tend to ingest um, many more eggs than, say, an adult would. If an adult is handling feces or something contaminated with feces, they're much less likely to ingest large amounts of it. And so we believe that uh, infections of people are much more common than what's been reported because what is reported are the severe infections. Also, so you're suggesting that there's asymptomatic infections of Bayless Ascaris? There are definitely asymptomatic infections. Um, sure. There have been some serologic studies done in the past and we're working with the CDC now to uh, conduct some serologic studies as well to look for those asymptomatic infections. And while most of the infections that have been reported in the literature are the very severe, either fatal infections or infections that lead to long-term uh, consequences for the individuals, there are also individuals that have minor damage to their eyes, and so they'll ha start to have vision loss, and they'll go in to the ophthalmologist, they'll observe the larvae and be able to kill the larvae, either with a laser or with drug treatment, 
and those individuals may not receive get back all of their vision, but they you know survive the infection. So is there? I mean, you were talking a little bit about treatment there. Is there a satisfactory treatment for this now? Because I know a few years ago uh, there really wasn't. No, there's still not um, any better treatment options available than historically. Um, if the infection is caught early enough, there are a number of antihelminth drugs that can be given to kill the larvae as they're migrating through your tissues. But once those larvae enter into your central nervous system, either your spinal cord or your brain, it becomes very difficult to treat those individuals because most drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier effectively. Mm -hmm. Um, or you just can't build up enough um, of the drug to, you know, kill the larvae. And unfortunately, most people who are presenting with clinical signs of Bayless Ascaris infection are neurologic because the parasites have crossed into their brain. Okay, let's um, go over to geography a little bit. Uh, back in 2010, when I was researching for an article I was writing for a laboratory journal, uh, one thing I wrote, and I quote, in North America, the prevalence of Bayless scarus procyonis in raccoons is highest in the Midwest and Northeast, where an infection rate of up to 80% has been reported. In the Southeast, there is a low risk. Bayless scarus is becoming an emerging infection in raccoons. So I guess my question to you is, you're in Georgia, I'm in Florida. Has the prevalence of this parasite increased in the South? Um, that's a great question. Historically, we've always considered the South to be relatively free of Bayless Ascaris, with the possible exception of the Appalachian uh, Mountains. And as you pointed out, the Midwest and the Northeast have been areas of very high prevalence. And nowadays, it's not uncommon to see very high prevalence rates in raccoons in Texas, Colorado, and as far west as California, Oregon, and Washington. So. We're not really sure if this represents a, a geographic spread of the parasite or just a better recognition of where the parasite has been all along. There, there are certainly arguments that people have been looking for Bayless Ascaris in the south, in the southeast, for quite a long time, and it hasn't been found until relatively recently. But when you start to look at all of those reports, it is interesting to note that many of them are 50 years old or older, Many of them were geographically limited to just a few counties, and many of those studies had relatively few numbers of raccoons that were looked at. So uh, you start to ask the question whether or not it was there all along, maybe an Apache distribution and was missed, or if there has been some spread. Back in 2010, the first report of Bayless Ascaris in Georgia outside of the mountains occurred, and that was in DeKalb County. And then a few years later, we found it in Athens, uh, just to the east of Atlanta. And then later that year, we found it in Florida for the first time. And we've been doing follow-up studies in Florida since then. Oh, anywhere in particular in Florida? Well, initially we found it in some raccoons that were being rehabilitated around Tallahassee. And then later that year and into the next year, we started working with several different agencies to investigate a Bayless Ascaris infection in a kinkajou that had been imported into Tennessee that was being sold as a pet. And it was traced back to southern Florida where it had been born and raised. And then later that year as we were investigating that, we found Bayless Ascaris in raccoons that had been submitted to a rehabilitation center in Fort Lauderdale. And so that really got us interested to figure out where exactly Bayless Ascaris was present in Florida because, you know, within 2010 and 2011, we found Bayless Ascaris up in the Panhandle and all the way south, uh, all the way down south near Miami. And working with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in the USDA, we've been testing samples throughout Florida, uh, and it continues to this day. And we've tested almost 900 raccoons now and we found 35 positives in 11 different counties that are scattered throughout the state. So the prevalence is still relatively low, especially when compared to the Northeast and the Upper Midwest, but the distribution is widespread throughout Florida. Interesting. Um, I guess the question that most listeners would be most interested in would be prevention. So what can people do to prevent 
becoming infected with this parasite. The good news about this parasite, it is relatively easy to prevent infection. And so you do have to ingest um, raccoon feces that have been in the environment for at least two to three weeks um, for it to become infectious. So just good personal hygiene, not touching raccoon feces. If you are going to have to clean up raccoon feces, wear gloves or take precautions to avoid um, touching it with your bare hands. Uh, avoid eating food or drink that could be contaminated with raccoon feces. And if you do need to clean up areas where raccoons have defecated, um, that can be problematic because eggs of Bayless ascaris are very environmentally resistant. Right. So they will survive in the environment for a very long period of time. And right now, we're only left with a few options, one of which is burning. So if you have a, you know, one of those propane flame guns, you can actually sterilize an area, taking appropriate precautions, of course, um, mm -hmm. to kill the eggs. Uh, if you are able to douse the area with boiling water, you can do that to kill the eggs. But once the eggs are into the, in the environment, they can survive very hot summers, very cold winters, so they're very resistant. Great. You actually answered my second question concerning uh, latrines on the property or in the house. <laughs> yeah, um, and so they do tend to use these latrine sites, and so if, whatever you can do to um, discourage raccoons from coming around the house, so not leaving food and water outside for outdoor pets um, or purposely feeding raccoons. Um, you know, if you have them in the habit of coming around the house, you're much more likely to have them defecating around the house, which would, of course, put individuals at more risk um, having feces closer to a dwelling. Great. Well, great advice. Well, in closing, um, I'd like if you could spend a few minutes to talk about any Bayless Scaris research that you and your colleagues are doing currently? Well, we have a couple different studies going on right now. Um, earlier I mentioned that we've been working with the CDC to look at asymptomatic infections. Right now we're concentrating on wildlife rehabilitators because those individuals have a lot of contact with uh, a lot of raccoons. And, you know, we've tested quite a number of individuals from Florida and um, we found a couple of positives. And again, that wasn't unexpected um, because typical adults are going to have very low exposure rates to the eggs. And so we would expect them, if they're infected, to have very low numbers of larvae that wouldn't necessarily cause clinical disease. We've expanded that recently. We've been testing people in Georgia and Virginia. And coming this March, we're heading off to the National Meeting of Wildlife Rehabilitators where we're recruiting rehabilitators from all over the country to participate in the study and hopefully we can get a, a better idea of the number of individuals that are asymptomatically infected and at the same time get at some risk factors associated with uh, infection. And with these data, we hope that we can start to educate people on taking appropriate precautions to avoid uh, transmission of Bayless Askers to people. Well, it sounds fascinating. Oh, you got some more? Well, one other thing that we're looking at too is domestic dogs. Um, domestic dogs are brought up periodically uh, in terms of Bayless Ascaris risk, and it's very common for dogs to have Ascarid worms, but it's fairly uncommon for them to be infected with Bayless Ascaris. What we don't know is really how common it is. There are these sporadic reports of published and unpublished um, reports of patent infections in dogs, meaning that they have adult parasites in their intestines and they're passing eggs into the environment. And domestic dogs, of course, would be a very high concern because of their close contact with people and potentially coming inside with eggs stuck to their fur. So we, we are starting some studies looking at um, the prevalence of Bayless Askers in domestic dogs. Very interesting. Well, I've been talking to Dr. Michael Yapsley from the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yebsley, uh, for your expertise and uh, very, very interesting talk. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.